Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started here in just a minute and we'll let the room fill up. Good afternoon again. Thank you for joining us, everyone. We'll give it about 30 more seconds to fill the room up here. Good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Give it about another few seconds to fill the room. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of the weekly Wednesday webinar series. My name is Alana and I have the pleasure of supporting this webinar. For any viewers out there, please note that today's webinar was recorded in advance. Thanks to CSL Bearing for their generous support of this presentation. We also ask that you please click on the links in the chat window or visit hemogenics.com to see the full important safety information and full prescribing information for hemogenics. With a history spanning over 100 years, CSL Bearing has been focused on serving people's needs by using the latest technologies to develop and deliver innovative therapies. Their advances in hemophilia treatment and serving that community have spanned decades, and we are grateful they are supporting this overview of gene therapy and hemophilia today. Today's webinar features three esteemed guest speakers. Dr. Guy Young is the Director of Hemostasis and Thrombosis Center and the Clinical Coagulation Laboratory at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine. He is also the former chair of the Scientific and Standardization Committee on Factor Eight, Factor Nine, and Rare Bleeding Disorders of the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, and was awarded the National Hemophilia Foundation's Physician of the Year Award in 2013. Dr. Tammy Singleton most recently served as the Chief of Pediatric Hematology and Director of the Hemophilia Treatment Center for the Mississippi Center for Advanced Medicine. She previously served as the Chief of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology, the Director of the Sickle Cell Center of South Louisiana, and the Associate Director of the Louisiana Center for Bleeding and Clotting Disorders at the Tulane University School of Medicine slash Tulane Hospital for Children. Lastly, Dr. Deborah Benson Kennedy is Vice President of Medical Affairs, North America for CSL Bearing, and has over 15 years of experience in clinical development. Since joining CSL Bearing in 2011, Debbie has served as a therapeutic head of coagulation, acquired bleeding, oncology, immunology, critical care, respiratory, and transplant programs. Thanks again for taking the time to join us today, and I will now turn it over to the pre recorded segment to get us started. Good evening. Thank you for joining our national broadcast. My name is Guy Young. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Southern California, and I'm the director of the Hemostasis and Thrombosis Center at Children's Hospital Los Angeles in Los Angeles, California. I'm honored to serve as the chair for this exciting event. And I couldn't be more thrilled to share the launch of Hemogenics with you. Tonight, we have more than 100 health professionals joining us to learn more about this new advancement in hemophilia B treatment. Hemogenics is the first and only FDA-approved gene therapy for patients with hemophilia B. CSL Bearing is committed to and invested in patients with rare diseases, including hemophilia B, and the launch of Hemogenics demonstrates this resolve. We hope you'll share the information and the insights you hear tonight with your patients and consider whether hemogenics is an appropriate treatment option for your patients and your practice. Now, I would like to introduce you to our esteemed faculty for this program. On my left here is Tammy Singleton. Tammy is the Chief of Pediatric Hematology and Director of the Hemophilia Treatment Center 
at the Mississippi Center for Advanced Medicine and the Louisiana Center for Advanced Medicine. And Debbie Benson Kennedy, Vice President of Medical Affairs North America at CSL Barron. Throughout this evening, we intend to understand why hemophilia B is a target for gene therapy. We're gonna learn about the clinical trials. We're gonna review efficacy data and the safety profile of hemogenics and identify patient characteristics for which hemogenics may be a good option. Feel free to share your questions via the chat function at any time during this program. We'll do the best we can to answer as many of them as we can at the end. Without further delay, let's get started. So uh, we're gonna start with a question for Dr. Singleton. What, what has you most excited about the future of managing patients with hemophilia B? Um, you know, guys, and we've talked a little bit about this. I'm stuck on the word um, opportunity. It really provides a significant opportunity to explore what our patients are doing that works, what doesn't work, what the possibilities are in terms of changing that, and actually now potentially having an answer for some of the issues that are occurring. So it, an exciting opportunity. Great, great. Well, thank you for that. And now we'll start with the main part of the program, and we're going to have you review with us the uh, evolution of hemophilia B therapy. So Tammy, Absolutely. please go ahead. I'll kind of take it away. So I think it's just really important uh, to explore where you've been in order to really have a clear understanding of where we're headed. So with that, let's take a look moving forward with all of the progress that's been made since just after World War II. I think a lot of us are pretty familiar with some of this progress. The most significant of which I think for patients living with hemophilia B would be the manufacturing changes with plasma derived products, the recombinant products in the 1990s, and especially the development of those extended half-life products. It was really new and exciting and really changed the lives of a lot of patients with hemophilia B, but we still have significant issues, gaps, unmet needs, and challenges, which we'll talk a little bit here with, uh, in just a second. So gene therapy pro really provides a really promising opportunity. And what you see reflected here is over 30 years of significant research, and clinical trials regarding gene transfer, gene therapy for patients overall with a variety of different conditions and disease processes. Now, what's also significant that you may not know is that there have been over 1,100 clinical trials that have either been completed or in progress regarding gene therapy. Again, the 2020s is where we have the most exciting time for patients with hemophilia. So let's sort of dive in and take a look at what some of the issues may be in spite of having um, excellent factor replacement products that patients use prophylactically or on demand. So despite that progress, hemophilia B continues to be a significant burden for patients with ongoing joint bleeds and damage as a result of that, even again with those patients being on prophylaxis. We know that that leads to a poor health-related quality of life, functional impairment, pain, control of that pain, social isolation, and a hot topic that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about, the anxiety and depression that results from that limitations on activity, and of course, an adverse impact on personal productivity. So if we were to concentrate on how to address some of those issues, what would be some of the key targets or clinical goals that we would have? One would be the reduction of bleeds, ultimately with a goal of having a reduction in joint damage. Two would be an increase in factor nine levels overall. And finally, these two things leading to a reduction in the burden of disease on patients living with hemophilia B. So what is the standard of care in terms of patients living with hemophilia B? Well, the standard of care is for patients, especially those with severe hemophilia, the use of routine prophylaxis to prevent or reduce bleeding episodes. Now we have a lot of patients who are still on episodic or on-demand therapy, and we certainly know that we're not meeting 100% targets across the board. So many studies will show that at least 75% of patients living with severe disease are on prophylaxis, still leaving that gap. Now take a look at this huge decrease in terms of those living with moderately severe disease. Only 20% of those patients are on prophylaxis. We still have a lot of work to do, and even with those patients who are living with hemophilia B and on prophylaxis, there are still significant challenges. So again, not all patients are optimally controlled when they're on prophylaxis. And what you're seeing here is data from the CHESS study. 
75 patients studied in 2019 and 2020, revealing that those patients who were on prophylaxis, 70% of those patients still had an annualized bleeding rate greater than two, again, still bleeding noticeably. 28% of those patients underwent a joint surgery on at least one joint, and 23% of those patients in the study identified a joint as a target joint. Now, more than 40% of the patients here in the study revealed that they had at least one joint problem. So joint damage overall can occur despite prophylaxis, indicating that in some patients, in some cases, prophylaxis is failing to control clinical bleeding episodes and especially those subclinical bleeding episodes. So what are the options and what does that sort of lead us to? Well, again, sort of looking at where we are historically, we're now looking forward to the promise of gene therapy. Now, how does this work? What is, what is the strategy? What's the foundational strategy when we think about gene therapy? So gene transfer therapies foundationally target monogenic disease processes or conditions where we deliver a, fun, deliver a functional gene through a viral vector. Now, when we talk about monogenic disease processes or conditions, we're referring to the list that you see here with the focus, of course, for us on hemophilia. So when we have a patient that has hemophilia, for example, we are going to start with gene transfer with an empty viral shell, this viral vector that will then transform basically into a therapeutic vector when the functional DNA is inserted into the empty viral capsid. So what is the difference between viruses and viral vectors? Well, of course, viruses exist naturally. They um, enter the body discreetly. They contain viral genetic material. They can penetrate and infect tissues, replicate, and cause an infectious disease process. Well, a viral vector is, again, an empty viral shell that does not contain viral genomic material, no viral DNA. And this empty viral vector will serve as the transportation vehicle for the functional DNA. So overall, what vectors are we using and what are we talking about? So AAV vectors, adenoviral vectors, it's a proven technology for the delivery of gene transfer therapy across many clinical trials. We use these AAV vectors because there's a specific target. We want to target certain tissues and there are subtypes of AAV, AAV5 to be specific, that can target the liver. So remember, we start off with this empty viral shell, this capsid where we will insert the genetic cassette that contains the functional DNA that will yield the adenoviral, the AAV vector that is then going to become the therapeutic vector. So overall, what happens in terms of a summary and what's the primary goal? So remember, we're starting off with an empty viral shell, the capsid that does not contain viral DNA, well, we will insert the functional gene, functor, functional factor nine gene, especially here, that will then yield or result in the therapeutic AAV vector that will ultimately be used as a single one-time infusion with in vivo gene therapy, gene transfer therapy, with a goal to have a long-term transgene expression from this single administration of this therapeutic vector. Now, hemophilia, of course, is a good target for gene transfer therapy. And why is that? So let's take a look at the characteristics of hemophilia B and then, of course, the attributes of gene therapy. So with hemophilia B, it's a monogenic condition. And ultimately, we want to deliver a functional copy of factor IX. Now, factor IX as a gene is relatively small and can be easily packaged into the genetic cassette, fitting into that transport vehicle, that AAV vector. Now, of course, when we're talking about factor IX deficiency, we're talking about a protein that's primarily produced in the liver, and that fits nicely in terms of the target of the adenoviral vector that will AAV5 target the liver tissue. Now, factor IX deficiency, of course, results in inefficient levels of factor IX, and of course, with this infusion of the AAV5 vector, the therapeutic vector, the goal and the thought is that this will produce sustained levels of factor IX. 
So in terms of what are the goals from a pharmacokinetic standpoint, we know that with standard factor replacement therapy, that there are peaks, that there are troughs, and there may be gaps in between. Now, long-acting fact, long factor replacement therapy caused us to have an option in terms of factor replacement therapy where with fewer infusions, but still having gaps in terms of the potential for bleeding with factor replacement therapy. The goal of gene therapy with this single one-time infusion is to have a sustained factor nine level with, that will fit nicely within those targets without those peaks and troughs and gaps that fall in between. Well, thank you very much, Tammy, for that really good overview of gene therapy. And it brings us to our first discussion question. So, and the question will go to you. Uh, given the unfulfilled needs in hemophilia B, what is the potential for gene therapy to impact the treatment paradigm? You know, I think that um, I keep going back to this word opportunity. I think that it presents a significant opportunity to reflect on what's working for patients with hemophilia B. And sometimes I think that maybe we don't ask that question in the right way. We haven't addressed it in the right way with our patients because factor replacement therapy um, has its own barriers in terms of the, the burden of actually infusing for some of our patients. So I think that gene therapy presents an opportunity to have something where patients can have those sustained levels, but with this single one-time infusion, eliminating some of those barriers, eliminating some of those issues. And it may not be right for all patients, but it certainly may be ideal for a large number of candidates. Sure. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I, and I think, you know, as I think about hemophilia treatment, there's sort of those two parts, which you, you alluded to now and you've addressed in your talk, which is the, the, the burden of the disease, right? What burdens the disease impart on patients, which obviously there's physical burdens, the bleeds, the joint disease, the joint damage. And then there's the psychosocial burdens, you know, missing time from school, Absolutely. missing time from work, you know, things like that. And then in addition, there's the treatment burden, the burden that's involved in actually treating. You mentioned the IV therapy, the repeated need for IV therapy. And in fact, the fact that there's peaks and troughs, so the levels aren't sustained. So that, that's how I view it is that is that you know gene therapy and the way that we've been describing it um, could address both the burden of the disease as well as the burden of treatment. Um, so great, thank you for that. And we'll move on to the to the next part, where we're going to actually introduce this you know new drug, Hemogenics. Um, and I'm going to turn to Debbie uh, Benson Kennedy, Dr. Kennedy, to uh, give us a overview uh, of the molecule, as well as uh, some of the early clinical trials. So Debbie, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Young. So I'm very excited to be here this evening uh, to speak about hemogenics and to make you aware that on November 22nd, 2022, CSL Bearing announced that hemogenics was approved by the FDA as a first and only gene therapy treatment for eligible patients with hemophilia B. Hemogenics is an adeno-associated virus vector-based gene therapy, which is indicated in the treatment of adults with hemophilia B who either use factor IX prophylaxis therapy, have current or historical life-threatening hemorrhage, or have repeated serious spontaneous bleeding episodes. And Hemogenics is designed for a single-use intravenous infusion only. Before I go into the details of Hemogenics, let's talk a little bit about some important safety information. Like all biologics therapies, infusion reactions are possible and need to be managed uh, accordingly. Infusion reactions can be as serious as uh, anaphylaxis, and this could potentially occur. So those receiving hemogenics need to be monitored very carefully and closely during their administration and for at least three hours after the, end of the, the infusion. And if symptoms do occur during the infusion, the infusion can be slow or interrupted, in addition, medical management can happen, and it's recommended that the infusion be restarted at a slower uh, rate once the in reaction has been resolved. There's also a risk of hepatotoxicity, and so it's incredibly important that individual patients after receiving hemogenics be monitored closely at least weekly for the first three months for elevations in transaminases, and corticosteroids should be considered if there are elevations. In addition, patients should be monitored for hepatocellular carcinoma, particularly those who are at risk of hepatocellular carcinoma prior to receiving therapy. 
a new mediated neutralization of the AAB capsid is possible and could potentially impede transgene expression. And in addition to monitoring transaminases, um, monitoring factor IX activity is critical. And in addition, if individuals have decreased effect, factor IX inhibitors should also be tested for. The most common adverse events in the HemeGenics clinical trial program were elevated liver function tests, headache, blood creatinine kinase elevations, flu-like symptoms, infusion-related reactions, fatigue, nausea, and malaise. So why was HemeGenics approved? Well, the clinical trials brought forward incredibly important information that in the patient population studied, that 37% was the mean factor activity sustained in this individual patient population after receiving hemogenics. And this led to a significant reduction in the annualized bleeding rate of these individuals. But most importantly, 94% of patients that received hemogenics discontinued factor IX prophylaxis and remained prophylaxis free. Well, how did we get here? Well, hemogenics was designed to achieve just this. Hemogenics is a non-replicating recombinant adeno-associated virus vector serotype AAV5, which contains a highly active PADOA variant of the factor IX gene, which is under the control of a liver-specific promoter. So the goal, as Dr. Singleton spoke of earlier, is really to address the root cause of hemophilia and replace functional protein. The clinical development program for hemogenics consists of three very important clinical trials. It started with a study evaluating a molecule called AMT060. This is the first generation of hemogenics. It was using the AAV5 capsid, but the encoding transgene was the native wild type factor IX. It was eva evaluated in two cohorts, and the higher dose cohort was very successful in transduction. However, the idea of having a much higher expression was factor IX was extremely desired. And so there was a design of hemogenics and a phase two uh, clinical trial was initiated. And this was to evaluate the PADOA variant. And then of course, with the evidence uh, from the phase two clinical trial, the HOPE-B trial was designed. And Dr. Young is gonna speak more about that in a little bit. So the phase Two clinical trial, its primary endpoint was to demonstrate factor activity at six weeks using the one-stage APTT clotting assay. It was critical to demonstrate that the Padua variant, the change to the Padua variant would increase factor IX expression in individuals. In addition, um, it was necessary to show that there was continuous activity in factor IX, that it was monitored factor IX replacement therapy, patients were evaluated for any bleeding, and of course, adverse events over the course of the clinical study. What was found in the study was incredibly important, important for the evolution of hemogenics clinical development. Patients that received, these three patients that received hemogenics had extremely um, successful transduction and expression of normal or near normal levels that were sustained of factor IX activity. At two and a half years, all participants remain, maintain their factor IX activity levels comparable to that at one year. What that translated to most importantly was the clinical benefit for the individual patient. We saw a decreased bleeding rate in these individuals after they received hemogenics. And at two and a half years, two patients reported zero bleeds in that window of time. And one patient reported two bleeds in the two and a half year follow-up period. So the phase two trial led to a lot of important conclusions. There was also no serious adverse events uh, deemed related to hemogenics. There was reduction in bleeds in the patient population, uh, reduction in the need for factor IX um, use, and there was no loss of factor activity and no requirement for immunosuppression in this patient population. And over three years, two, particip two participants remained free from bleeds and the use of factor IX therapy altogether. All right, thank you very much, uh, Debbie. And now we're gonna move to the pivotal phase three trial, which is called HOPE-B. And uh, this is a trial that's been presented in abstract form in multiple meetings and will be published fairly soon. 
So let's take a look at the clinical trial design. So you see there is a lead-in period. <clears throat> the lead-in period was uh, at about six months or more where patients were treated with factor IX prophylaxis. So they had to be on prophylaxis to enter the trial. Um, and, and then I'll mention this, this was a phase three trial, single dose, multi-center, multinational. Um, and it included patients with severe or moderately severe hemophilia B. And we'll go over the inclusion exclusion criteria shortly. So, if, <laughs> excuse me, following the lead-in period, there was a single IV infusion of hemogenics, and then a post-treatment follow-up period, which is ongoing and will go on out to five years. Uh, the main primary endpoint, which you see in the brackets between six and 18 months, is the comparison of the annualized bleeding rate from the lead-in period when patients were on factor IX prophylaxis to the time period between, again, six months and 18 months while patients were on uh, or following the infusion of hemogenics. So let's take a look at the key inclusion. So this trial was only for adults and only for male patients. We know male patients are the ones that are essentially uh, mostly, if not almost entirely afflicted with severe, moderately severe hemophilia. Patients have to have a level of less than 1% uh, for those with severe hemophilia, which is of course the definition, or patients with moderate hemophilia could be included if they had less than or equal to 2% factor IX at baseline. They all had to be heavily pretreated, as you see, more than 150 previous exposure days, and they had to be on continuous prophylaxis for at least two months prior to screening. The key exclusion criteria is these patients could not have inhibitors to factor IX, and a screening test was done for that as well, uh, but also not having a history of inhibitors to factor IX. Uh, secondly, the patients had to have um, controlled, if they had viral infections like HIV, hepatitis B or C, they had to be uh, under effective control. They could not have advanced liver disease. As you've heard, this is a molecule that is being used to transduce hepatocytes. So of course, we need a healthy liver if we're going to have an effect of this molecule. And then liver function tests were done just to further assess that the liver was in good shape before dosing. Now, a key difference with this molecule and others you may have heard of in gene therapy is that patients with pre-existing neutralizing antibodies to the vector, in this case, AV5 neutralizing antibodies, they were assessed uh, during the screening phase, but these patients were not excluded from participating in the trial. And I'll show you later that a good proportion of the patients had these neutralizing antibodies during the trial. <clears throat> um, and again, the primary endpoint was the annualized bleeding rate for all bleeds compared between the prophylaxis phase, the lead-in phase, and then between six and 18 months after the infusion of hemogenics. Other key secondary endpoints are the factor IX activity. Of course, this is the whole goal of the gene therapy is to increase factor IX activity. Um, so that was a key secondary endpoint. I mean, the main endpoint, again, is the ABR. And also, we made calculations on the use of factor IX replacement therapy after the infusion, as well as looking at other specific endpoints, such as reduction in annual joint bleeds, reduction in annual spontaneous bleeds, and also looking at the correlation between the factor IX level and the pre-existing AAV5 neutralizing antibody titer that was done at baseline. Here are the baseline uh, characteristics of the patients, and I won't read through this. Uh, you can see these are adult patients. You see a wide age range between 19 and 75. Um, you can see that they met the inclusion criteria with respect to the severity of hemophilia. There was a pretty good number of patients who had previous infections, viral infections, due to uh, having received uh, factor products in the past. Uh, um, but these, again, these were all under control. You see the pre-screening prophylaxis, you know, which product the patient was on. And then you can tell there that 39% actually had detectable neutralizing antibodies to AAV5 before getting the infusion. And 26% had zero bleeds in the lead-in phase. So here's the key or the primary endpoint. So you're looking here at the ABR while on factor IX prophylaxis in the blue color. And you see the ABR was 4.1. After the hemogenics infusion, the ABR was down to 1.9. And I will point out to you that there are a few patients who didn't respond as well as we had hoped, which I'll discuss momentarily, which certainly impacted on this uh, median ABR for the uh, after the hemogenics infusion. 
And now here we see in the lead-in period, the percentage of patients who had zero treated bleeds. That was 26%, as I had mentioned. In the post-treatment period, following the infusion of hemogenics, between, again, months 7 and 18 or 6 and 18 during that year, 63% reported zero bleeds. And here we looking, <clears throat> we're looking at a histogram over time, a box and whisker plot. You can see the one stage uh, APTT factor IX activity. It's important to point out that the one stage uh, factor IX assay is what was used in this trial, and that's the one that's most readily available in your centers. You can see that there's a very stable level of factor IX after the infusion. You see that by week three or four, you're pretty much at that steady state level, and it remains steady throughout the dosing period out to month 18, and in fact, even here you see out to month 24 or two years. I'd like to pause here for a second and, and ask Tammy, you know, you've seen uh, these results here now. Um, you know, what, um, you know, what do you think of, of those results? I don't know, you know, as just as you were um, going through that, I started reflecting on um, some of my actual patients. And um, going back to what we were talking about before, the challenges that patients face, the barriers that are faced, that, that patients face. So, you know, one, there's um, there's hemophilia and what we want to accomplish, try to accomplish, even for those patients um, who are on prophylaxis and still having some issues with those gaps. But there are so many patients that are not on prophylaxis and they're not on prophylaxis because of those barriers associated with infusion, barriers um, to actually following through you know, with the adherence and barriers for many years, us maybe not even thinking that they really required um, treatment and therapy. So I think that looking at that data, I just see a lot of, um, op using that word again, opportunity. Sure. Yeah, opportunity um, to have those um, ongoing conversations, to have real shared decision-making, because now there's a, a, a new product and opportunity from a therapeutic standpoint to really address some of the issues. Oh, thank you. So turning to this slide, uh, and again, the, the idea behind hemogenics is to increase factor IX levels, allow the patient to endogenously produce factor IX. If they can make their own factor IX, then they shouldn't have uh, bleeds. So we already showed you the ABR data. We showed you the factor IX levels. We showed you the percentage of patients with zero bleeds. But the other point is we want these patients not to have to do prophylaxis. Remember earlier in the discussion, we said that there was also the treatment burden. We want hemogenics to address the treatment burden. So in the trial, what percentage of the patients were able to discontinue the prophylaxis they were on heading into the trial? And you can see here, it was 94%. Now you might ask, what, what about those other three patients? What happened to them? One of those patients did not get the complete infusion. In fact, only got 10% of the infusion because he had an infusion reaction and the physicians and team treating that patient elected to discontinue uh, the infusion. Now we'll have to talk about that momentarily uh, because we don't want that to happen to other patients. The second thing is that there was one patient, or I should say the second patient, is that is a patient at a very high titer neutralizing antibody, which we'll show you momentarily. That patient had no transduction or essentially no transduction of the vector due to that antibody, never achieved a factor IX level. So of course, you have to go back on routine prophylaxis. So I have a really good explanation for why those two patients did not respond. The third patient did respond, but he was using some factor IX infusions during that time period of the primary analysis. And so it was determined that he wasn't really uh, free from routine factor IX prophylaxis, even though he wasn't really back on full prophylaxis either. So that's the third patient uh, that is not included, or the third of the three who uh, did not discontinue routine factor IX prophylaxis. So if we take a look at the safety, first of all, there were no treatment-related serious adverse events. There was no new factor IX inhibitors. So that's really important information. You see here in this chart, the various uh, adverse events that actually Dr. Kennedy already reviewed all of this in the earlier safety discussion. I do wanna come back to the infusion-related reactions. You can see here that 33% of the patients had an infusion reaction. And while in hematology, we use a lot of drugs that can cause infusion reactions. And typically, if it's a really serious reaction, we would stop the drug and maybe bring the patient back another day, do the infusion later on. 
But when it comes to this gene therapy, this is the only chance to get it. Once the patients get the gene therapy, we'll show you in a few slides, they'll develop antibodies to it. So the time of that infusion, when that infusion is being done, it is critical that the infusion be completed. And if the patients have an infusion-related reaction, it simply needs to be treated. You know, the way that you know to treat infusion reactions, you could stop the infusion temporarily, you could slow the infusion rate down, you can give medications such as corticosteroids or antihistamines, but one way or another, the infusion needs to eventually be completed. Of course, you see that, you know, out of the uh, patients, 19 had those infusion reactions, uh, but another um, 18 uh, did have the infusion reactions and completed their infusion. So there's a little bit more information about infusion reactions. I I'm not going to read through this. I think you you've probably all seen infusion reactions to biologics. Uh, and in the event of that happening, again, the infusion could be slowed or stopped. Medications could be administered. But it is really important to make sure you complete the full infusion. As far as hepatotoxicity, again, Dr. Kennedy went through some of this, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. Suffice it to say that while ALT elevations did occur in, in a number of patients, most of these were fairly mild elevations. They were almost entirely temporary elevations. And the key point is those in the first few months may indicate or likely indicate that there is an infusion-related, uh, not an infusion-related reaction, but an immune response against the, uh, the transduced cells. We'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. Uh, and when that happens, that corticosteroids could potentially be used. So the point really is to monitor ALT, AST values. And uh, uh, if those go up, those uh, early on, that could be considered an immune-mediated reaction. If they go up later on, probably just the patients need to be monitored. And in most cases, these went back down to normal. In a few cases, they remained elevated, albeit at a, at a mildly elevated rate, for some time uh, towards uh, the latter months after the infusion. The other issue is if there's ALT elevations um, and factor IX levels go down, you certainly should consider uh, factor IX inhibitors as a possibility. But in addition to that, consider a course of corticosteroids in order to blunt that immune-mediated response uh, so that the patients can maintain uh, a good factor IX level as we hope that they can. As far as uh, hepatocellular carcinogenicity, again, that was discussed a bit earlier. I'll just point out that there was one subject in the trial who did develop hepatocellular carcinoma. That patient had pre-existing risk factors for hepatocellular carcinoma, and his tumor was evaluated extensively uh, for a uh, link or some sort of relation to the AV vector. And it turned out that through these vector, uh, vector integration analyses and whole genome sequencing, that it was very, very unlikely that that vector had anything to do with that patient's hepatocellular carcinoma. Still, if you have patients with risk factors, as you see the risk factor listed there, and you give them a hemogenics infusion, you should follow them closely, consider abdominal ultrasound screenings every six months, every year, and alpha feeder protein measurements as well, up to five years after the infusion. So here's the immune-mediated neutralizing uh, antibody response. So first of all, every patient who got infused did develop AV antibodies. Well, that's not surprising. We gave them a big infusion of an AV5 vector capsid. But importantly, in the patients who had pre-existing antibodies, those with a titer up to one in uh, one to 678, or about one to 700, did show factor IX activity. It was numerically a little bit lower than the group that did not have pre existing antibodies, but they were able to maintain and show factor IX activity. There was one subject who had a very high titer, over 3,000, so about four, four and a half times higher than the next highest patient, and that patient had no factor IX expression. So it was felt that his titer was so high that it did impede the transduction of his hepatocytes, and therefore he had no response. And that's one of those patients I mentioned earlier who had to go back on prophylaxis. With respect to um, infusing the patients and, and anti-AV5 antibodies, we definitely recommend that patients will be followed in a post-infusion or gene therapy registry. There's one by the World Federation of Hemophilia that just got started. There'll be one with Athen as well that we will talk about. Monitoring laboratory tests, again, Dr. Kennedy went over this. You want to monitor factor IX activity levels. After all, that's the goal of the gene therapy. So of course you want to see where their factor IX levels are. Certainly the patients are going to want to know where their factor IX level is. You can use a uh, one-stage clotting assay that you have available in your center 
There are some slight differences between the reagents, and so you may get slightly different levels if you're switching from one reagent to another. So try to use the same lab uh, when you're measuring factor IX activity post-infusion. If you happen to use a chromogenic substrate assay, which is not really commonly available in the US for factor IX, uh, you will get a numerically lower result. Um, and again, if you are worried about factor IX levels dropping, definitely check for a factor IX inhibitor as well. So we've now reviewed all of this um, uh, really exciting data and interesting data. And so I want to turn back to a panel discussion and ask, you know, based on this clinical evidence, uh, Dr. Singleton, um, how do you see with this clinical evidence, how can this impact patients' lives with hemophilia B? Again, as you're presenting the data, um, and many of you out there may be kind of doing the same thing, I just start thinking about all the patients um, that I've seen over the years. Um, they're all so different. Um, patients over 18, between 18 and 25, you know, over 30, uh, all the various challenges that they face. Um, the patients, um, ultimately, I can, again, kind of divide them into two different categories. Um, patients that are on prophylaxis and still having significant issues in terms of breakthrough bleeding episodes, joint pain, um, maybe even facing some barriers to care just in general. Again, that whole adherence because this is an IV infusion. And then, of course, there are patients who maybe really desire to be on prophylaxis or trying to follow through with a prophylactic regimen, but are have faced challenges over the years in terms of really, really doing that. And so I think this, when looking at those two reasons, all the various groups and types of patients, I think that this clinical evidence really um, supports the fact that this could be a fantastic option for patients to have those sustained levels, eliminating those barriers and kind of unmet needs that they face. Oh, thanks. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I think as I think of my patients, you know, they come in obviously different ages, mm -hmm. different lifestyles. Right. You know, we all have those different kind of patients uh, that we're thinking about. Um, and so as I think about a, a treatment like this and how it could impact um, patients with hemophilia B, you know, I think about the young adult who is, you know, leaving home, going to college, getting a job. I mean, for them to be carrying their factor nine around, it, it's challenging. Some of them actually fall off uh, prophylaxis at right. that point. I've got quite a number of those. Um, so so that, that's a type of patient who I think, you know, could be a good candidate for hemogenics. But then you also think about like a middle-aged adult might have two or three kids. Um, he's got to be dealing with them, taking care of them, along with his, his wife or his, his significant other, and um, also might have a job. And so for him, you know, it suddenly becomes like, well, the priority, I've got, I've got my kids, I've got my, my spouse, my significant other, I've got my job. And, you know, the hemophilia becomes even more of a burden. So you can think about a patient like that who, you know, sort of relieving them of that burden of, of hemophilia, of treatment, and of the disease issues that can keep them out of work, keep them away from playing with their kids, that could be a good candidate too. <clears throat> I'm sure those of you out there who are thinking about this, you probably are thinking about even other types of categories of patients where, many. you know, what you see from this evidence could really, could really benefit those patients. Yeah, many different types. All right, so thank you. So with that, um, we're going to move on to this idea of patient selection and management and, you know, how might you think about this in a, in a sort of thoughtful uh, manner. And one is the shared decision-making model. I think we all do this. We're all very familiar with this. The key points here are, you see, number one would be information seeking. So you're out there listening to us. You're seeking information about gene therapy, about hemogenics, um, and thinking about uh, how your patients might be seeking information and how you could help them um, gain information about this. That's the first thing. Learn about this. Have them learn about it. Understand it. Then it comes to the, the decision-making part. It's like, okay, well, what are they on now? Is it working for them? Um, is it not working for them? Or is it working for them, but it's really challenging to continue with the therapy? What might be the best option for their clinical and their personal goals? And that's when you kind of make a decision. What do you want to do? If ultimately you decide that, hey, you know, hemogenics sounds like it might be a good idea for this patient, then you get to the treatment uh, initiation part where you're really planning to do the infusion that's where you're going to go through the patient's clinical history. You're going to go through various aspects of potentially eligibility criteria. Is their liver healthy? Um, do they not have a factor IX inhibitor that might be hidden somewhere? Things like that. And then you determine, okay, this patient is eligible to get the gene therapy. And then you get to the point where, all right, now we're going to do it. 
Once you do it, there's a post-treatment follow-up. Short term is pretty intense. There's a lot of lab testing that needs to be done to ensure that you know, you're, you're assessing for hepatotoxicity, you're assessing for immune-mediated responses, you're assessing whether they should start corticosteroids. And I should mention that in this trial, while not many patients needed corticosteroids, it was about 16%, so it wasn't zero either, uh, to help manage these immune-mediated responses. And then post-treatment, long-term, I think it's important to tell these patients, look, you still have hemophilia, we still need to see you. Now, if they're doing exceptionally well, you may not need to see them that often, but at least once a year, probably. So that's part of all this decision-making that goes into this before you decide to treat somebody uh, with this product. So again, which patients could be appropriate? Adult patients with hemophilia B, who are currently on factor IX prophylaxis, or what I call should be on factor IX prophylaxis. That's those other two. Somebody with a history of a life-threatening hemorrhage, um, and, and just for some reason it's not on prophylaxis, maybe they don't want to do it, maybe they did it in the past, or somebody's got repeated serious spontaneous bleeding episodes, but again, it's just choosing not to do prophylaxis perhaps because of the treatment burden. So those are all some of the indications in the prescribing information as well. Of course, you want to make sure they don't have a factor IX inhibitor and adequate liver health, and I think we've already discussed that extensively. <clears throat> so what recommendations you know, do you have for identifying candidates for treatment with hemogenics, something I want you to think about and something I want Dr. Singleton to opine about. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So I think it's important across the board to just provide general education. So typically, I'm, what's happening new in hemophilia today? So I want to make sure that all patients that have hemophilia B are at least aware of the fact that this exists, um, that this is on the horizon. Um, so I think that's the first place to start. Secondly, I think that um, you then focus on patients that may be potential candidates, that may follow through, that may be significantly interested. And then we'll, of course, go through the el eligibility process to see if, you know, can you follow up with um, all of the laboratory testing very frequently? Um, are you going to be able to do it for a long period of time? We'll be able to communicate reliably in the interim. But I think that overall, you just start very broadly, provide the information, make sure everyone knows about it, um, and then you can kind of take it from there. Sounds like a really good plan yeah. to me. Um, so what about the next steps? This is sort of just a summary you want to discuss. So identify patients who you think might benefit from hemogenics and start that conversation with them. Confirm eligibility. We've discussed that quite at length. Uh, there's the list there of things that, that you could be doing, should be doing. And then recognizing and telling patients it's a one-time dose. Um, so this administration uh, does have to happen in an, in an infusion center, takes one to two hours, obviously should be prepared for infusion reactions and things like that. Um, each dosing kit is personalized to the patient's weight. And you can get more information about that from your, your CSL hemogenics reps if you're getting to the point where you're like, hey, I think I want to treat one of my patients with it. And then tracking the progress, right? So regular follow-up after, what is their factor nine level doing? All those issues we talked about with liver health as well, and those issues for monitoring them for potential liver complications, including hepatocellular carcinoma. So with that, I'm going to pass it to uh, Dr. Benson Kennedy to talk a little bit about what CSL has with respect to support services. So thank you, Dr. Young. Um, so in addition to providing uh, the ability for physicians to order free of charge a neutralizing antibody, hemogenic specific neutralizing antibody BB5 test, um, there are support services that are available for the entire hemogenics journey for both patients and physicians. So Hemogenics Connect has been designed by CSL Bearing and supported by CSL Bearing to give a dedicated team of individuals to support your patients. Determining patient eligibility for financial assistance programs, uh, particularly a very difficult challenge navigating insurance, the assessments, coverage, explanation of benefits, and helping your patient understand uh, what's available to them. In addition to supporting logistics and travel support, if individuals have to travel to go to an infusion center, um, and particularly for uh, physicians that may need to refer a patient to an infusion center, we have an ongoing commitment to provide these services and support resources to both you and your patients. So once again, you can do this by contacting Hemogenics Connect. 
in addition, CS Health Bearing is very supportive of further continued research in the gene therapy arena. Um, we know that there is a long standing history in the hemophilia community and that long standing energy and support for research in this space. So, we recommend all patients that receive hemogenics enroll in the Athen registry and have continued long term follow up well beyond the five years in which the current primary clinical trials will be following patients. All right, well, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all of you for participating. We'd like to turn to some Q&A um, and please enter questions in the chat now. Um, if you haven't entered them yet, there's a good opportunity to enter some questions in the chat. Um, and we're happy to answer you know, as many questions as we have, as we have time for. Um, so with that in mind, and uh, while I hope some of you are typing away asking this question, we do Jesus. have one question to start with. That question is, regarding the durability of treatment, given the turnover of hepatocytes, and that new hepatocytes will not harbor the treatment gene, how long can we expect the treatment to last? So Dr. Singleton, you want to take that uh, first crack at that? Yeah, sure. And so I, I think that we just go back current right now to the available clinical trial data. So we have information over three years telling us that the, the levels are, are sustainable and they're there. So only long-term follow-up will ultimately determine what are we actually dealing with? What will happen in eight years or seven years or 10 years? What do you, you know, kind of think about that too in terms yeah. of the clinical trial? I mean, I think this is a, you know, it's a big topic of discussion. And of course, you know, we were able to make available 24 month data from the pivotal Hopi clinical trial, but the phase two data will continue on and provide five years of follow up um, in the near future. But I think we have to reflect on historical heme hemophilia B gene therapies. And I think that that's also important information to really understand the dynamics of the liver and when you receive a gene therapy and how long you can express. And so we're very fortunate to have experience in gene therapy for hemophilia B now that is data out 11 years. So extremely hopeful that this pattern will continue and patients will have the ability to express long term. Yeah, you know, I'd like to add to that actually is that. Um, and Dr. Benson Kennedy mentioned the um, earlier version of, of eugenics, AMT 060. And that's the same vector. So the vector, the promoter, oh, everything is the same, except eugenics has the PADUA mutation. So if we take that as, as, a, as a good marker for what we may expect in the future, as you look at those trials, there are patients out five years that are now published out even longer than that. And, and they've maintained their expression. Now, albeit th that expression is lower because they didn't have the PADGO mutation. So I think that even within this specific molecule, you know, we have some optimism that this is going to last a longer period of time. With respect to the, you know, the turnover of hepatocytes, it's a really good question. I've actually asked hepatologists and we don't really know how rapidly hepatocytes turn over in adults. The fact that we see the gene therapy lasting <clears throat> as long as we have, including as you mentioned, Debbie, some of the older trials back to the University College London trials that are back to like 2010, we have some hope that really with, with, with hemophilia B gene therapy anyway, that, that this will be you know, longer lasting. Uh, I will say that you know, in terms of pediatric patients, first let's say that you know, this molecule is not indicated for that. There have not been gene therapy trials in hemophilia in patients less than 18. And that issue of turnover of hepatocytes obviously becomes much more important as we get to younger children, but it's gonna take a lot more research, a lot more time to really figure that out. So this is really just for patients 18 and older where perhaps the hepatocyte turnover is not as rapid. So um, let's get to another question. In the event of a serious injection reaction or infusion site reaction um, or infusion related reaction, I guess is the best way to put it, can hemogenics treatment be discontinued and then resume? The answer is yes. <laughs> Um, but as you pointed out earlier, it's incredibly important to complete the infusion. And going back to the data, most of those infusion reactions were not life-threatening infusion reactions. And so I think it's important to, to get that out there and kind of have a dialogue about that, that infusion reactions may occur. It is very important to have a plan. Um, maybe at your site, you'll have a protocol in terms of how you're going to manage an infusion reaction. Um, at some centers, I'm kind of familiar with protocols where an infusion reaction occurs, 
you stop the infusion, provide maybe corticosteroids, antihistamines, maybe fluids, but then you resume the infusion, typically around half the rate of where the reaction occurred. So I think it's important to have that plan in place up front to explain to patients that these reactions can occur. They're typically not life-threatening, but to certainly have a plan to, to address it. So yes, can you stop it temporarily to make sure that the patient is safe and then to provide um, care in terms of fluids, corticosteroids, antihistamines, and then have a plan to resume, for sure you can, and you should. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I'll share some personal experience, actually. So um, I was a participant in the trial, and one of the patients I infused had an infusion-related reaction. And it was, you know, it was not a minor reaction. It wasn't life-threatening, but he was having, he was shaking, he had uh, some hypotension. Um, so we stopped his infusion temporarily. We gave him antihistamines. We gave him some hydrocortisone. Um, things calmed down fairly quickly. Within 15, 20 minutes, things calmed down. We resumed the infusion at a, actually at a much slower rate initially, like 10%. And then we gradually increased it up to about 50% of what it was. And, and we completed the infusion. It took longer than the one to two hours that it should take. It took like three to four hours, but we completed it. That patient still went home the same day. And, and the next day he was fine and then you know, really no further issues. So managing the infusion-related reactions is critical. And Tammy, what you said is the best advice, which is have a plan before, right? Know what you're going to do if it's going to happen. That's really crucial. Yep. So let's get to another question. Uh, can you please summarize uh, how long should the post-administration monitoring be and what does it entail? Maybe we'll start with, uh, with Dr. Kennedy. Thank you. So, you know, Clearly, the infusion component is, is well-defined. So once the infusion is complete, you need at least three hours. Keep an eye on the patient, pay attention. But it's incredibly important you continue to do laboratory evaluation. So the recommended post-treatment um, follow-up is weekly uh, liver function tests and factor IX activity, and to continue that through at least three months. And of course, if individuals have a change in their liver function test, then the longer term um, evaluation of corticosteroids are initiated it's until they're normalized and then initiating a steroid taper. All right, really, thank you for that. Um, and, and, and I would just add that the, you know, the long term, of course, is gonna be a lot longer than that, but yes, the critical time is early. Um, so here's another question. Can patients with liver fibrosis receive hemogenics treatment? Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Benson Kennedy, for that one. Yeah, so I think it's more the goal with liver fibrosis is the extent of fibrosis, uh, which is why ultrasound and fiber scans are, are recommended. However, individuals with liver fibrosis can be treated, and it's really important to do the total overall assessment of individuals' liver health. Yeah, I think, you know, we're looking at and wanting to have patients to have good, healthy liver function. And, you know, there were degrees of liver fibrosis measured by the uh, thromboelastometry ultrasounds. And that's something I think that, you know, if you have a result that, that, that shows some liver fibrosis, probably it's important to have a discussion, you know, with even a hepatologist saying, you know, like, how bad is what this? What does this mean? You know, what does this mean? How good is the liver function? Uh, because, you know, you want to make sure that there is, you know, sufficient hepatocyte capacity um, to that the gene therapy is going to ultimately be, be effective. So here's another question. Um, you shared that patients with AV5 neutralizing antibodies were included in the HOPE clinical trials. What differences were observed in factor IX levels and bleed protection? And um, either one of you want to answer that? Yeah, I think that you mentioned that um, the patient that had the highest titer outside the patient who didn't have transduction at all was just was pretty close to 700 in terms of a titer. And that those levels were not quite as high as the other patients who were in the clinical trial, but there was certainly still a pretty significant response. I think when I think about this, just from a practical standpoint, you know, as a treater, I think that um, I would still want to proceed ahead using the results as a guide, but understanding that it's probably still very worth trying with patients um, and understanding that the levels may not necessarily be as high as all of the other patients or with someone who's completely negative, um, but they certainly shouldn't be excluded. What do you think about that from that so standpoint? I think understanding more deeply the impact of neutralizing antibodies um, on patients receiving hemogenics is important. So we're gonna do continued further research in that space. Um, but one of the most important things I think about individuals with neutralizing antibodies, except that individual with a high titer is that 
they had um, the ability to stop prophylaxis. So we look at factor nine levels as being, you know, the reason why you stop prophylaxis. But I think that continuous expression over time that those individuals still had really helped those patients and they stopped prophylaxis. So I think that's really a key feature I about those individuals key. with with neutralizing antibodies that were in the study. Yeah, and I'm trying to recall the exact number, but it, it, the level for those who had pre-existing antibodies was not substantially lower than those who did not. It was modestly lower, I think maybe still around 30%, something like that, maybe 28%, but it was still you know, at, at a you know, relatively high level within the mild range and they still had a response. And, um, yeah. and that, that data is correct. That's a correct conclusion. And there wasn't statistical significance. I mean, I think this is what's really important. I think there's a lot of transparency in this trial to explain what's observed. It's a small number of patients. Um, so I think it's really important to understand each individual patient and the dynamics of that. But there was not a statistical significance between the two populations. And I think the key point that you pointed out, again, those patients still discontinued or were able to discontinue prophylaxis. Yes. So I, I, to put it simply, I think that that's something that we should focus on. Yeah. And I, and I would say it's really important to get those titers. Um, as Dr. Benson Kennedy mentioned, that CSL will do that test at no cost and that you can talk to your hemogenics reps to figure out how to do that, but it'll be done at no cost. And then depending on the result, you'll then have to make a decision on, on what to do. Um, certainly titers of up to, well, 678 or about 700, those patients did respond. One patient at over 3,000 did not. Um, so depending on the result you get, it may be fairly clear that you could proceed if there's a titer's negative or right. if it's fairly low in the low hundreds, maybe up to the mid hundreds. Certainly if it's over 3,000, I, I would probably advise not to give hemogenics because we saw that in that one patient. What do you do in between? It's, it's really quite challenging. And, and I think I would advise you that, you know, if you're not sure, you know, seek some help, right? I mean, there are uh, those of us in the U.S. who participated in the clinical trial, and, uh, you know, you can get that information uh, as well. You can uh, talk to CSL Bearing. If necessary, they can connect you with, with experts in the field um, who can discuss that with you. And it, it's not always going to be an easy decision to make. And that's, we know that in hemophilia, Sometimes we don't have easy decisions to make. So, um, so that's something to, I think, I think it's something that we will need to be learning a lot more about all the more reason to enroll more patients, you know, in, in uh, those follow-up studies, the Athen registry, the WFH registry, so, so that we can learn uh, more about that. Um, I think that I don't see other questions from the audience. Again, if you have a question, please go ahead and, and, and type that in. Oh, okay, great. One more popped up. Um, and actually, uh, we're running out of time, so this will be the last question. In the Hopi clinical trial, which factor IX assay was used? Um, and the second part is if the chromogenic assay was used, what is the correlation with the one-stage assay uh, result? So maybe, Dr. Benson-Kennedy, can you answer that? And then, and then we'll let Tammy have a, a word on that as well. Yeah, so, so the APTT reagent that was used in the Hopi cut was an APTT reagent, and it was synthesil. So um, I think it's important to really pay attention to what reagents are used in the APTT setting. Um, from a chromogenic uh, standpoint, in comparison to the one stage, it was about 50%. Um, and I think that that's, that's been established with other paddle variant uh, um, gene therapies and more understanding about the paddle variant and how it behaves in these different assays, which is a little bit different than native wild type factor nine. Yeah, so just to make that clear is that the chromogenic assay was about 50% lower oh, yes. than the one stage assay. Um, and so, yeah, Dr. Singleton. I've, uh, I've seen the same thing with my clinical trial patients, you know, across the board that those chromogenic assays roughly are about 50%. You know, I can almost know what to expect. You know, when I see the one stage result, you know, I'm kind of looking for that chromogenic understanding it's gonna be about 50% lower. Great. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who made tonight possible. Uh, your hard work and perseverance made hemogenics a reality for patients uh, in need of a long-term treatment option for hemophilia B. I want to thank our excellent speakers, uh, Tammy Singleton, Debbie Benson-Kennedy, for introducing hemogenics to the medical community this evening. And thank you to CSL Bearing for sponsoring this broadcast. I hope you found the information during this session valuable and that you're as excited as I am about this new intervention that you now have in your toolbox for your patients with hemophilia B. So again, thanks to our speakers, 
confident that you're going to leave this program with a more thorough understanding of hemogenics and how it can benefit your patients with hemophilia D. If you have further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to your hemogenics representative. Thank you again for your interest in hemogenics, for joining us this evening, and have a good night. Thank you for attending today's webinar, and a special thank you to the generous support of CSL Bearing for helping to bring you today's presentation.